Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me for this presentation on Regression 101. My name is Todd Schwartz uh, with UNC Department of Biostatistics, and I'm intending to hit many topics related to uh, linear regression today, um, and so we will dive right in. So we're going to start off, I'm going to show um, various uh, statistical results. Um, as you can see, I am using SAS, but there's nothing unique about this output. Uh, you would be able to generate this from any other type of statistical package. Um, and so I will try to point out the different results. And again, you should be able to replicate these, um, whether you're using SAS or some other package. Um, and I'm going to be using uh, data from uh, JOCO OA, the Johnston County Osteoarthritis Project, uh, to illustrate these various methods. And you can see what's on my screen now um, is uh, a, a listing of descriptive statistics for uh, a number of variables, uh, again, from this Johnston County Osteoarthritis data set. Um, you can see that I have uh, information here on four different variables. Uh, I have a body mass index, uh, which is defined as kilograms per meter squared. I have participant weight in pounds. I also have participant weight in kilograms. And I have the participant um, age. And in this listing of descriptive statistics, you can see I have information on uh, the number of observations in this particular data set. Again, this is being used for illustrative purposes. Uh, you can see that I have roughly 330 observations. Um, because these ends aren't all the same, uh, I do have some missing data. Uh, in terms of the mean values, you can see I have a mean BMI of just under 30, uh, mean weight in pounds of about 180, uh, mean weight in kilograms of 82, and a mean age of 61 years. Standard deviations are also given to provide a measure of variability, as well as minimum and maximum values so that you can see the range that applies, again, for this particular data set. So what we might be interested in looking at is um, some bivariate relationships between uh, these variables. And what I'm showing here is something that might seem a little bit surprising. Disappeared. So after the descriptive statistics, we can start to examine some bivariate relationships. And by bivariate, we simply mean we want to look at the association between two variables. And for now, we're interested in looking at the bivariate relationship uh, for two continuous variables. Uh, one way that we can visualize that is through a scatter plot. And in this particular scatter plot uh, that I have on the screen, uh, it might look like um, a very distinct kind of pattern. And in fact, you can see that what we have is all of the data points uh, falling on a perfectly straight line. Um, and as we examine this, you can see on the y-axis here, I have weight, uh, participant weight in kilograms. And I need to scroll down so you can see the x-axis. but it is the participant weight in pounds. And so this is actually not a surprising result because I essentially have two variables that both represent weights just on different scales. 
Um, so again, I could have predicted that this scatter plot would look like this. Um, and when I have a scatter plot that looks like this, or if I have a pair of variables that just differ by, say, adding or subtracting a constant, or multiplying or dividing by a constant, uh, then I have the same information in both of those variables. And so we say that they are perfectly correlated. Uh, in this case, you can see that because I have a positive slope, meaning as one increases, so does the other, uh, we have a correlation coefficient of one. Uh, if we had an inverse relationship, so that, for example, we had a negative slope, meaning as one increases, the other one decreases, this would be a negative slope, and we would have a correlation coefficient of negative one if all of the elements fell on a perfectly straight line. Uh, so this was not surprising, um, but you can see what would happen if you look at the bivariate relationship between um, two variables that are uh, essentially the same information just packaged in a different way. Here's a probably a, a more interesting scatter plot and you can see here from the y-axis now I have BMI on my y-axis and I have weight on my x-axis and as we know BMI is related to weight but it also incorporates height. So we don't have a perfect correlation. We don't have all of the data points uh, falling on a perfectly straight line. However, we still have a pretty strong correlation. And the way that we can see that here is we can see that all those data points are pretty tightly clustered okay, along, um, around uh, sort of what that best fitting line would be. And we're gonna get into that. Um, and, and how that pertains to uh, linear regression. But you can see that we have this tight fit as opposed to if we just sort of had some random scatter of points that might not have any general pattern at all. So again, this is visualization. Uh, we haven't actually done any statistics to evaluate um, this bivariate relationship. Okay. Here, what we've done now is, again, back to weight in kilograms versus weight in pounds, and we've just taken that same scatter plot and uh, superimposed that best fitting line. Not surprisingly, um, all of those data points fall precisely on that line. If we move to weight versus BMI, uh, or rather BMI versus weight, now you can see what that best fitting straight line would be. Um, and this is actually the simple regression line. So this straight line that goes kind of through the middle of the data um, is that best fitting line, our simple regression line, and you can see how the scatter uh, plot, the, the data are scattered about that line. Okay, if we want to start to quantify the strength of the association, the way that we can do that is through correlation coefficients. So we're interested in this table here, and you can see that it's labeled as Pearson correlation coefficients. And what we have here is a correlation matrix. And so uh, for any pair of variables, for example, if I wanted to look at BMI against weight, then I can find BMI in my row, weight in my column, and I can see the corresponding cell. In this case, it's saying that my correlation coefficient is 0.84. The p-value there is less than 0 0.0001, so it's highly statistically significant. And I have 331 observations that have information on both BMI and weight um, so that they contribute to the calculation of this specific correlation. Now, 0.84 um, for clinical studies, that tends to be a pretty strong correlation. Um, the actual magnitude and, and using terms like strong or moderate or weak uh, is somewhat context uh, dependent uh, in the sense that sometimes when you have highly controlled uh, variables that come out of a, a laboratory experiment, you might expect to see correlation coefficients, say, of 0.99 or, or very, very close to one. Um, and sometimes in clinical studies, um, with a broad representation of individuals, you might have a correlation of 0.3 and consider that to be strong. 
so it is dependent on the context and, and the sample. Um, but in this case, we see that the correlation between BMI and weight in pounds is 0.84. Uh, so that's pretty high, as we would expect. And again, consistent with what we saw in that scatter plot. What I'd like to note is that if I look at the correlation of BMI with weight in kilograms, we get exactly the same value. We get exactly the same correlation coefficient of 0.84 with the same p-value because again the relationship is the same. Weight in pounds or weight in kilograms contains the same information and so each of their correlations with BMI is going to be identical. Um, moreover, if I looked at the correlation between weight in pounds and weight in kilograms, you can see that I have this perfect correlation as we saw when we looked at the scatter plot uh, of one. Uh, one more correlation coefficient we want to look at here is if we look at the correlation between BMI and age, we actually see that we have a negative correlation coefficient, meaning that they are inversely related. So that one interpretation is that as age increases, BMI is going to tend to decrease. That coefficient is only uh, at negative 0.13. The magnitude is not that great. However, the p-value is 0.015, and so it is statistically significant uh, at the 0.05 level. And some of that has to do with the power that we have to detect uh, those magnitudes through the sample size. So those are correlation coefficients, um, again, uh, reflecting the strength of the, of the linear relationship between two variables. Uh, and again, we can see here um, that whether we have uh, some scaling factor or not is not going to affect uh, the correlation coefficients. So we can move on now and start to actually look at regression. You can say, well, why did we spend so much time talking about uh, say, these bivariate uh, associations or correlation coefficients. And that's because they are tied in with what we want to illustrate next using regression, which is what we want to call simple linear regression. And when we use that word simple, that implies that we have a single x variable, a single independent variable, a single explanatory variable. Um, those are all synonyms for um, what we're trying to do here. So we have uh, a single y variable or dependent or outcome variable, and we want to look at its relationship with a single x variable, um, again, explanatory uh, or independent variable. Um, and so when we have that relationship, you can see that it is bivariate. We have a single x, we have a single y, and we'd like to use regression to illustrate uh, what that relationship is. And so I just want to walk you through a little bit of the output that um, I'm showing here. Again, if you're uh, in SAS, this is from PROC REG, uh, which is used for regression. And I am going to look here at the relationship between BMI. You can see that it identifies BMI as my dependent variable. And in this case, I'm going to look at that as it relates to uh, weight, so BMI versus weight. This is uh, a relationship that we've already looked at through the scatter plot and through the correlation coefficient. And what we want to notice here is we get a little bit different information. Uh, so one of the ways that we can quantify this is through what's called the R squared. And this is literally taking that Pearson correlation coefficient, which we call R, and we square that. Um, so I think we had a value of about uh, 0.89, um, something like that. Um, actually, we can go up here and remind ourselves what it was. Okay, sorry, it was 0.84. If we take 0.84 and we square it, okay, we're going to get this R squared value of 0.7. 056. And that has an interpretation um, that's nice. One way we interpret that value is we say that we are able to explain about 70.56% of the variance in BMI from 
the knowledge of the weight. So the percent of the variance in Y that's explained by X. So we have that information. Um, so we actually can determine the Pearson correlation coefficient from this simple linear regression model. Also, I want to note that the p-value that we have here, which is the same as the p-value we have here, those are the p-value, that's exactly the same p-value that we would see from the correlation coefficient. Again, here, because they're all less than 0 0.0001, we can't tell whether they're the same, but if we did have some value to four decimal places, we would see that both of these p-values are exactly the same, and they would be exactly the same as the p-value that we saw in prop four, or um, for that correlation coefficient between BMI and weight. Now we get some other information here. Um, we get information on the slope, and so we have a section of the output that's labeled as parameter estimate here, and we get an intercept and a slope. And if you remember your middle school algebra. You can uniquely determine a line if you know its intercept and its slope. And if you remember the uh, intercept and slope form of a line, we get something that looked like this y equals mx plus b, where your slope was m and your intercept was b. Well, now we have an intercept. Okay, the value is about 6 here, and m, the slope is about 0.13, y would be a BMI, and x would be weight in pounds. Um, and so we can actually determine the slope of that line. This is the line that we looked at uh, when we superimposed that best fitting line to the scatter plot uh, between BMI uh, and weight. Okay, so we can actually estimate those values using regression. Um, and the way we would interpret that is we would say that for every additional pound in someone's weight, we're expecting their BMI to increase by about 0.13 units. Okay, so that is how we can interpret that value. It has a clinically relevant uh, interpretation. So let's uh, scroll through some of the additional output that we get here. And we can look at another uh, simple linear regression. And in this case, you can see that we have, again, the dependent variable here of BMI. But now we want to look at the independent variable that's still weight, but in kilograms. And hopefully, not surprising to you, that R squared is exactly the same as what we saw in the previous simple linear regression model, and that's because the correlation was the same. And again, we're going to take that Pearson correlation coefficient R, and we're just going to square that. So um, that 0.84, if we square that, again, we get uh, about 0.71. Um, also, what we want to note is that now, these p-values are still the same as what we saw before, but now the slope is different. And the slope is different because the scale has changed. And when I tell you the interpretation, hopefully it's obvious why it changed. If I interpret this slope, it's saying for every additional kilogram in a participant's weight, okay, the BMI is expected to increase by 0.29 units. So the prior simple linear regression was talking about a one unit change in weight, and the unit there was pounds, so that was a one pound increase. Here, a one unit change is in kilograms, and so having a different scale is going to have an impact uh, on the actual magnitude of the slopes, even though the underlying relationship uh, does not change. So that's looking at some simple linear regression models. And I'm going to scroll through some of the additional output that SAS is going to give me. And I'm going to look next at the simple linear regression model that applies for looking at BMI as a dependent variable. But now with age. So age is going to be my independent variable. Uh, if you remember, the correlation coefficient was something like negative 0.13. If I take negative 0.13 and I square it, I'm going to get a positive value, and you can see that I get about 0.02.
And so it's saying that only about 2% of the variance in BMI is being explained by age. Um, also, you can see now, um, if you remember from the correlation uh, output, that we had a p-value of 0.0151, and this is demonstrating how the p-value up here, the p-value down here, um, match exactly with the p-value that we had for that correlation coefficient. So another way to say this is simple linear regression is going to give us all the information that we uh, saw with the correlation coefficient as well as additional information such as the actual slope of the line. Uh, and we want to note here that this slope is negative. We already knew it was negative because the Pearson correlation coefficient was negative, but now we have the actual estimate of the slope. It's negative 0.01. Again, if I were to interpret that, it's saying for every additional year in age, I'm expecting BMI to decrease by about 0.076 units. And again, that is statistically significant at the 0.0151 level. So that's looking at simple linear regression uh, with continuous variables. We might also be interested in looking at categorical explanatory variables. So we're still going to have a continuous dependent variable. And our focus is on the mean of that variable. But sometimes we have an explanatory variable such as gender that's shown here, and it's coded as zero for male and one for female. And we might be interested in seeing how that categorical variable might affect my dependent variable. So in this case, you can see from this frequency table that I have 130 males, I have 202 females. I can determine the mean weight. See, my analysis variable is weight. And I can look at how that mean is affected by gender. So in this case, my mean weight for males is about 190. My mean weight for the females is about 175 or 176. If I were to try to do a formal comparison, of those means. One uh, method that is commonly used, and hopefully you've seen it before, is the t-test. And so this is output from PROC t-test in SAS. And you can see from this output that it's going to give me uh, the two different genders. So again, zero was male and one was female. It's going to tell me those sample sizes. It's going to tell me those means. It's going to calculate the mean difference. So it's saying that there's about a 14 pound difference uh, where the males were higher than the females. And they're still just descriptive statistics. But if I scroll down here, here is where I actually get my t tests. And these are the t values and the corresponding p values. I actually have two different versions of the t-test depending on whether I'm willing to assume the variance uh, in the two groups are equal or not. And if I assume that they're equal, my t uh, statistic is about 3.3. And with 330 degrees of freedom, that gives me a p-value of 0 0.0012. Uh, if I'm not willing to assume that they're equal, I use um, this unequal variance version. Um, which gives me a similar t-statistic of about 3.3. Degrees of freedom is adjusted for the fact that I have unequal variances, and I have a similar p-value, 0 0.0009. Uh, either of these would lead me to reject my null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis here is that the mean weight for males was equal to the mean weight for the females. So I would actually reject that. Uh, and conclude that the mean weight for the males is higher uh, than for the females. Okay? And again, the estimate of that was about 14 pounds, uh, which we saw up here, of uh, 13.98. Okay, so that's a t-test. Um, again, you might say, well, why are you spending time talking about that? Well, it's because we can also 
replicate that same analysis in a linear regression model. Um, and specifically in a linear regression model where we have an explanatory variable that is categorical and in the case of gender is actually dichotomous where we have two levels. Um, so you can see here um, that I have these two levels of gender, zero uh, and one, again, zero corresponding to the males. Okay, I can run this regression model, this simple regression model, and I have a weight as my dependent variable, but now I'm going to use gender as my independent variable, and uh, you may have seen this before. The way that we can incorporate a variable like gender with values of male and female into a simple linear regression model or a uh, a linear regression model is through what we call dummy variables or indicator variables. These are zero, one variables where I have to choose one of the levels and code it as uh, one and the other level and code it as zero. So I'm going to actually code male as one in this case. And what you can see from this output is I get a value for this gender that is 13.98. Now, hopefully that looks familiar because that was the same value we saw from the t-test that showed the difference in the means between the males and females. So again, the simple linear regression now with a categorical and dichotomous explanatory variable okay, is actually interpretable as that difference in the means. That is actually the means for the males, that's my estimate for the mean for the males, minus the mean for the females. And I put the hats over that because it's an estimate. Now, the p-value that I get here of 0 .1, 0 0.0012, again, is not new. That is the same p-value that we saw. Let's scroll back up here. Okay. From the t-test, where I assumed equal variance. So again, what we see is that we can get information out of a regression model that replicates a simpler kind of analysis in case, in this case, a two uh, group independent sample t-test. So I actually get the same information and in this case, I can say that I have a mean difference between the males and females of about 14 pounds, and that is statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.001. Okay. So we can also look at more than two levels of an explanatory variable. So in this case, we now are looking at a three-level explanatory variable. We're taking the BMIs and we are grouping them. You can see the definitions here. So BMI group of zero, our BMI is less than 25. A BMI group of one corresponds to a BMI between 25 and 30. And a BMI group of two is a BMI greater than or equal to 30. So you can see uh, the distributions that we have in those groups and I can go ahead and generate the mean of uh, weight by those three groups and as I would expect when I go from the lowest BMI group I have a mean weight of 142 as I go to that middle BMI group I have a mean weight of 172 and with the highest BMI group I have a mean weight of about 208. Well, I can also look at this through a uh, linear regression model. Now the way that I can accommodate having more than two levels in that explanatory variable is I can actually have not just one zero one coding or dummy variable, but in this case I have two. And the way this works is if you have k levels of your explanatory variable, you're going to have k minus one dummy variables, and you're going to have k minus one uh, terms in your model that represent those. So since here we have three levels, k minus one, three minus one, I'm going to have two 
of terms in my model, and you can see what they are here. Okay. And essentially, the one that's left out serves as what we call our reference group or our reference level. So what this is going to show us is that for that lowest BMI group, okay, the mean weight is 65 pounds less than our reference group, which was the BMI greater than or equal to 30. Okay, that is highly statistically significant. And for that middle BMI group, the mean uh, change in weight is about 36 pounds. So it's 36 pounds less, we see the negative sign, than the reference level. Again, BMI greater than or equal to 30. And we have, again, highly statistically significant. So these models are very flexible. They can handle continuous variables. Uh, they can also handle continuous, I'm sorry, categorical variables, whether it's two levels or more than two levels through dummy variables. All right, so I want to illustrate um, one other thing here, and I want to start moving from simple linear regression to multiple linear regression. I'm going to look at a different dependent variable in this case. And here what I want to do is I want to look at KL grades, Kelvin Lawrence grades, for the right knee uh, in these participants. And you can see that those are coded on a zero to four scale. And you can see the distribution that we have for each of those. So what we want to do is we actually want to focus on the mean of this variable. So we're going to uh, treat it as a dependent variable. Uh, some people might um, take issue with that, but that's not what I want to discuss today. But uh, for illustrative purposes, we're going to consider this as a continuous variable where we're interested in the mean of that particular variable. You can see the distributions here. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to look at how that KL grade is related to injury in that same knee. So here is a variable uh, that is representing knee injury in that uh, same leg, uh, leg, the right leg. And you can see I have two values, yes or no. Uh, in this case, if I'm looking down here at this parameter estimate, I actually have a p-value that is greater than 0.5. It's about 0.6. So actually, I have a statistically non-significant result. And what it's showing me is that the mean KL grade okay, is only about 0.1 units left for those that did not have a knee injury relative to those that did. And that is so small that it is not statistically significant. I can't conclude that it's different from zero. So that's uh, the same thing that I would have seen if I had done a two sample t-test on uh, KL grade comparing those with knee injury versus those without. And um, I can look at, again, by knee injury, I can look at some other variables. In this case, I'm uh, just going to skim over that. And I'm going to now look at a result from a model where I not only have a single explanatory variable, but I want to actually include multiple explanatory variables. So I'm going to still have a single Y variable. In this case, my dependent variable for my Y variable is still that KL grade for the right E. But now for the explanatory variables, I'm going to include not only the injury status of that E, but I'm also going to include BMI, age, gender, and race. Okay, so I actually have one, two, three or five X's. Okay. Up till this point, we were only considering a single X variable or a single uh, explanatory variable. But uh, as we move to including more than one, 
being simple linear regression to being multiple linear regression. Um, and so a lot of the concepts that we've already talked about still apply, but there are some important differences, and we're going to talk about those now. So one thing you want to notice is that when I am modeling these explanatory variables, okay, I can have a mixture of continuous variables like BMI and age, as well as categorical ones like knee injury status, gender, and race. So I can accommodate different kinds of variables within a single multiple regression. Uh, if we go back to this notion of the R squared, the R squared here is about uh, 0.17, and what that indicates now is that uh, about 17% of the variance in the KL grade is being explained jointly by those five explanatory variables. So I have a nice interpretation of that. And what I want to look at here is that these five explanatory variables are being modeled simultaneously. So I'm not doing them in separate models. That is an important distinction if I start looking at these actual terms that are in the model. And that's what's shown here. So for each of these five variables, I now have these parameter estimates, as well as standard errors and test statistics and p-values. And essentially what I'm doing here is I'm testing each of these terms separately in terms of their association with the KL grade, my, t my dependent variable. And what's important here is that when I do it in the context of a multiple regression model, I'm looking at the association of each of these terms with Y, but now I'm adjusting for all of the other X's. Or sometimes we say controlling for those X's, or sometimes we say holding those other variables constant. So what that allows you to do is to say, I want to tease out the effect of each of these variables above and beyond the impact of those other variables. So this is, this is a common way um, that we can control for things that we know are important uh, or maybe confounders or we maybe want to treat as covariants and again hold those things constant. Um, and so in this particular case, if I were to focus on the knee injury variable, what we can see now is that that p-value is still non-significant, so there's no significant relationship between knee injury or not uh, and the KL grade, okay? But now when I interpret this value, okay, which is saying that those that did not have an injury have a lower KL grade uh, on average by about negative uh, 0.12 units, Okay, but what's important now here in this context is I'm now going to say that that is controlling for BMI, age, gender, and race. Okay. Likewise, I could look at this effect of gender, okay, which corresponds to a gender of zero. So this is actually for the males. Okay, what this is saying is that the mean KL grade is about 0.06 units less for males than for females. And I'm adjusting for knee injury status, BMI, age, and race. So what it's doing is it's looking at each of the associations adjusted for everything else in the model. And I'm doing that statistically through One last thing I want to show you here is that in this model, while I, I included BMI and age um, as they appear in the table, sometimes we might also be interested in looking at scaled versions of those variables. And in this case, the model is the same, except now I have, instead of BMI and age, I have BMI 5 age 10. And what that does is that says instead of interpreting this as a one unit in BMI and a one unit in age, meaning one year of age, I can actually scale these variables to make these estimates more clinically relevant. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying instead of for a one unit change in BMI, which may not seem to be that much, 
I can say for every five units in VMI, I can see what the impact is on KL grade. Okay. This p-value and this test statistic, those are going to be identical to when I had just a one unit change. So I'm not changing the nature of the relationship. I'm just making these, uh, these slopes more interpretable. And likewise for age, instead of a one year change in age, I can now look at a decade change in age and see what that impact is on the KL grade. In this case, for every additional decade in age, I'm seeing a 0.3 increase in the KL grade. Um, again, just to contrast that, what we saw when we had the uh, actual ages. Okay. For a one year increase in age, we see that it was only 0.03. So basically we're going to take that times 10 and we'll get the same thing that we see down here from this model with the scale versions. Uh, again, those p-values are unchanged because I'm not changing the nature of that relationship. So that's all I wanted to cover today. And we covered a number of different topics. We looked at simple linear regression where you have a single y variable and a single x variable. Uh, we extended that to look at uh, categorical x variables. So x could be either categorical or continuous. Uh, and then we extended that to uh, multiple linear regression, where you can have any combination of continuous and categorical explanatory variables or x variables, but still with just a single y variable. What we're interested in in all of these is a focus on the mean of that dependent variable, so that we're modeling the mean of y um, in these in these models, um, and we've illustrated their connection with, say, Pearson correlation coefficients um, with t-tests. Um, and I hope this information has been very useful to you. Thank you for your attention.